I didn't realize that what I had proposed was impossible. But as someone who has spent most of their life <clears throat> tackling impossible situations, I guess I'm going to have to try. I hope my American friends will understand if I tell it the way I see it. And I certainly have been telling my own government in very uh, blunt terms in recent months what I think of them. But that is not the subject today. <clears throat> the first mistake the new president made was to keep or try to keep his election promises. I've never said that to anyone before in my life. <laughs> and, you know, I know that's a broad statement, but one in particular I think was very unfortunate, and that had to do with the uh, travel ban and lack of issuing visas to uh, citizens of a few countries that happened to have a majority of Muslim uh, citizens. And more about that later. There's so much going on that I will only deal with four other major issues. The cabal, the banking cartel, defense expenditures, and global warming. One conclusion I reached, however, it is impossible to even guess what is happening today unless you know what has been happening for the last three quarters of a century. And I run into quite a few people who have no idea. As early as October 1940, years before Germany surrendered to the Allied armies to vaporize Hitler's vision of empire, the Council on Foreign Relations, headquartered in Washington and New York, had its committee on economic and financial affairs write a memorandum outlining a comprehensive policy, and I'll quote, to set forth the political, military, territorial, and economic requirements of the United States in its potential leadership of the non-German world area, including the United Kingdom itself, as well as the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere and I presume that includes us, and the Far East. The Grand Area, as the non-German bloc was called in 1941, apparently was insufficiently grand, and the preferred ideal was an all-inclusive one-world economy dominated by the United States. It was at this stage that there was a virtual merger of the Council and the U.S. State Department, which, in late 1941, created a special committee to consider positive planning, the Advisory Committee on Positive Foreign Policy, on which uh, council members, that's the members of the Council on Foreign Relations, played important roles and set the stage for key decisions that would affect the post-war world. Well, these were the seeds of a new world order, and they have been working at it ever since. At the end of the war, they got a break with Operation Paperclip. And I'm sure that most of you here know about Operation Paperclip. But the U.S. military had their eyes on the Nazi, some of the Nazi scientists and engineers and wanted to get their hands on them before somebody else did. So they got President Truman to agree, but on the condition that they didn't include anyone who has strong Nazi connections. Well, the military, as I know from personal experience, uh, paid no attention to the caveat that the president had applied, and they got a lot of scientists and engineers who had very strong Nazi connections. And uh, they were brought to the United States. CIA gave them new 
identities and uh, new names and uh, the new files were paper clipped to the old files and that's where the paper clip came from and then they were given important jobs in both the military and the civil departments of the United States. I sometimes add, I don't know if I've got time to do it today or not, it was kind of ironic, here was the CIA bringing in German Nazi scientists and, uh, and engineers on one hand, another group in the CIA out looking for Nazis who got into the country somehow to throw them out. But that's the way the world works. And just about then, some UFOs crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. And they were, as well, you well know, this group knows, were not the first crashes, but neither in the United States nor in the world. But it was the first ones that got prominence. And uh, they became a watershed in publicity. In my early days in this business, the first question people would answer me is, do you know about Roswell? And I was pleased to be able to say that I had some small inkling of what had happened there. It was on Tuesday, July the 8th, 1947, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, that Colonel William Blanchard, commander of the Roswell Army Airfield, put out a press release saying that they had uh, recovered a flying disc. And this was reported in the local papers. That was the truth. Hours later, Brigadier General Roger Ramey said, no, that was a mistake. It wasn't a, a disc, it was a Rowan weather balloon. And that was a lie. It was not only a lie, and incidentally, I don't think the Brigadier General did it on his own. I think he had been ordered to do it. I read something recently that his wife was very distressed, and he was too, at having to, to make that decision. But it was a cornerstone stone lie in what has become a culture of untruths and disinformation. Well, then, as you know, President uh, <clears throat> Truman established MJ-12 <clears throat> with um, virtually dictatorial powers uh, in respect of UFOs and the ET file. They passed the National Security Act with its provision of right to know which I really didn't take as seriously for quite a long while as I do now. I think it has been used to screen a lot of people who might otherwise have been in the loop and to uh, make it very difficult to really find out exactly what has been going on. Meanwhile, the group that was back engineering, one of the vehicles captured at Roswell, moved to Nevada and set up uh, operations there. And of course, they were secret operations. When General Eisenhower wanted to know what was going on, they refused to tell him. And uh, would you be surprised to know that that didn't please the general? After all, he was the President of the United States and had been the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe and to have troops allegedly under his command not telling him what was going on, I think uh, rubbed him the wrong way. So he threatened to send in the first army from Colorado, and that got their attention. And so they allowed him to send, th I think it was three or four, I can't remember which, of his close friends from the CIA to go out and take a look around at, I guess, both uh, Area 51 and S-4. And they reported back exactly what was expected, and that was that they were uh, back engineering one of the craft that had uh, crashed near Roswell. And this was really, I think, the experience that led to the general making that famous statement in his last address to the people of the United States, his farewell address, where he said to beware of the military-industrial complex. And what he was really talking about was to beware of the fact that a lot of very highly sensitive things, including the UFO and the ET file, was perhaps in the wrong hands. 
I wish he'd come out and said that, but I can understand why he didn't. It was what we call political language. And unfortunately, unlike with most, with, like most prophets, we did not pay any attention to him. We've read the speech many times, we've quoted from it, but no real action was taken. And that, dear friends, is, in my opinion, one of the principal reasons why the world is in such a mess today. Meanwhile, the original Council of Foreign Relations plan, reinforced by Nazi scientists, had picked up some allies. Most important, the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers started as a European group and then spread, but they were, had some noble ideas in the early, de in the early days. But then they became a self-interest group and the most secretive and, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous secret groups in recent uh, history. And later, when uh, Japan started to come up, Zygmunt Brzezinski uh, said to uh, David Rockefeller that we should include Japan in some of these things. and so. Uh, he took that to the Bilderberg meeting, and it was approved, and they came back and set up the uh, Trilateral Commission, and then you had the three. You had the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, and the Council on Foreign Relations, and in my books, I call them the Three Sisters. Most important, the Bilderbergers and their associates, the Bavarian Illuminati, um, brought a new dimension to the whole thing. And from that group really came what I and others have called the, the cabal. And they are the apex of the cabal. And they include the banking cartel, because the major bankers of the world are all represented in the Bilderbergers. And then next to them was the oil cartel. And then next to them were the CEOs of the transnational corporations. Then the intelligence agencies, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the all-seeing eye, the MI6, the British MI6, and the Israeli Mossad, and more. And then a huge, huge slice of the US military. And together, they have been running the United States and much of the world for decades. And the end game is a new world order, which was announced by George Bush Sr. when he was the president. And it sounded like utopia. It sounded like peace and prosperity for everyone in the world forever. And it had a wonderful ring to it. But he must have known, as a former director of the CIA, some, at least, and maybe much of the score. And what is really planned is an unelected, totalitarian government of the world. And you can call it what you like. People have called it fascist, they called it Nazi, and recently some people have been calling it the Fourth Reich. And David Rockefeller, a lifelong heavyweight, spilled the beans at a Bilderberg meeting where he said that it would be better off if the world was run by bankers and the elite than it would by these self-elected groups in the democratic system. And I wouldn't use his name if he hadn't confirmed these ideas in his memoirs, where he in fact boasted about the plans that they had made and the success that they had had, helped in large part by organizations like the New York Times, Washington Post, Life, and, uh, and other important news outlets which had attended, had representatives at the Bilderberg meetings, and which had taken their oath and were playing their game. 
Well, the cabal learned from Hitler's mistakes. Instead of attacking one country after another and getting the whole world upset and against them and immediately putting up resistance, they decided that it would be that the pen was mightier than the sword and that their strategy would be a combination of monetary system, the banking system, and trade agreements in order to achieve control. And according to Professor Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University, the cabal's plan is the brainchild of a clique of international financiers. Quigley wrote in Tragedy and Hope in 1964, and I would like to quote from that, the powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, in secret agreements, arrived at in secret private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. If you want to know how secretive they are, not even prime ministers, presidents, secretaries of finance or finance ministers are allowed to attend their meetings and they keep no minutes. This surreptitious scheme has been very successful in the globalized economy. Even Canadian officials and governments have swallowed it, hook, line and sinker. Instead of using the Bank of Canada, which we own outright and which served us so well for 35 years, it helped create the money for the government of Canada to get us out of the depression. And I was there, I know. And then to help fight the war, and we made the fourth largest contribution on the Allied side. And then after the war, to um, help with the infrastructure requirements of the country, including the St. Lawrence Seaway, Trans-Canada Highway, great new airport terminals, and the Dew Line, the U line, for those of you who are not familiar with it, was the distant early warning line that was put right around the periphery of the continent, most of it being in Canada, so we paid the lion's share of big high-powered radars to watch for Russian planes that might come, or rather Soviet planes at that time, might come across uh, our lines. And to help us establish a really first-class social security system. And all of that was done without the accumulation of any significant amount of debt. And in 1974, they changed the system. The Bank of Canada abandoned its shareholders and started taking its orders from the BIS in Basel, Switzerland, and it's been downhill ever since. And we've been going into debt. And when my good friend from the US Ms. Brown uh, told me how much interest we had paid. I really didn't believe her. I had it checked out by the Parliamentary um, Research Bureau. And we had, from 1974 fiscal year to 2013-14 fiscal year, paid $1.17 trillion in interest, and all of it unnecessary. If you, can, if you translate that into U.S. terms, you're talking probably about uh, $13 trillion, which is a lot of money when you get money from somebody who creates it out of nothing instead of having some of it, at least, created by your own central bank. And now we find ourselves in the position where the Canadian government is trying to pass a Canada infrastructure bill. The Senate almost managed to get further consideration of it, but finally capitulated this last week. 
And the principal aim of the bill, unstated but true, will be to allow the international banking control to bring back some of their millions or billions of dollars in assets that they've had hidden offshore for the simple reason of not paying taxes so there would be more taxes left for the rest of us to pay, especially the middle class and the poor, and translate that paper wealth into real assets on the ground by buying or building airports and ports and transportation systems and so on and getting an annual return of 7 or 9 to percent. Well, interest rates that you could borrow from are, you know, 1 percent, 1 and a half, 2 percent. Well, the Minister of Finance, when he was asked why he didn't use the Bank of Canada, said, and I quote, it would be excessively inflationary. That upset me because it wasn't true. I can't stand people lying in people's face. And so I wrote him a letter. He said this in the House of Commons in response to a question that had been put to him in the Commons. I wrote him a letter and said that wasn't true, it was a lie, and under British parliamentary rules he should resign because ministers are not supposed to lie in the House of Commons. And I proved the case in the long letter that I sent him, along with a lot of Canadian monetary history that he probably was unaware of. So in any event, that's the direction we're moving at the present time, financially, and it's one that's going to lead to continued austerity and increasing debt, period. And the U.S. is even worse off because a little over a hundred years ago, the Congress gave the American birthright to create its money to a handful of the richest bankers in the world. And the Fed has been ripping off the U.S. and the world ever since and will continue to do so as long as it exists. The result, Americans have become slaves to Wall Street and the European banks that own the Fed. I saw a YouTube this week from, uh, by Robert Reich, former Labor Secretary, I think he was, if I remember correctly. And if you get a chance to see it, uh, it's worth watching. And he has his, his blackboard there and does the, the little uh, paintings that you do. And the President not only cut taxes for the rich, which means a hardier burden for the others. But he, uh, he now is allowing the bankers to do exactly what I was just describing in the U.S., to go out and build the in infrastructure and to get a very generous return on it. It's not new. It's been tried in Greece, where, Lord permitting, I will go tomorrow. And uh, it didn't work. They have a lot of infrastructure they don't use, and they have a lot of debt that they can't pay. Now that's the system that is now being imposed on the U.S. and Canada. Well, the other means of gaining control and dominance has been trade agreements. It started with a free trade agreement between Canada and the U.S. Canada wanted just two things, the exemption from U.S. dumping and anti-subsidy laws and a gradual phase-in, indeed a back-end loading of tariff eliminations. The U.S. had two demands, immediate abolition of the infamous former Foreign Investment Review Board and a faster implementation of tariff reductions, given the facts that Canadian tariffs were already higher than U.S. tariffs. In the end, the Americans achieved both of their demands and Canada struck out on both of its. The numbers looked okay because we were selling more to the United States, largely energy, for which there was an insatiable demand. And the auto pact helped because there were moving parts of cars back and forth across the border, and every time they crossed the border, they counted in the figures. 
And finally, the farmers did their thing and started exporting more. But the bottom line was that their net return did not improve a bit. So figures lie, and sometimes so do our newspapers. NAFTA, free trade on steroids. I can say unequivocally three cheers to Donald Trump for saying that NAFTA was a bum deal. It's considered that way by all three countries, but certainly Canada and the United States. And finally, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was going to be the mother load of them all. And if it had gone along, or if it is, comes back out of the ashes, it transfers so much power from the people to transnational corporations that you can just forget about any democracy in the future. So I would say the president gets full marks on saying just exactly what that was all about and uh, saying to scrap it. Well, everything, of course, is pretty well on course for the cabal and the new world order. Until 2016, the presidential elections, normally, the cabal had one candidate on each side, someone they could control and who wouldn't start improvising too much. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, they had an election where they only had a candidate on one side because the candidate on the other side had beaten all of the candidates who might have been acceptable to the cabal. And Hillary Clinton was okay, so Donald Trump was a loose cannon. The cabal was in shock. Trump regaled the press for being unfair, and they were. According to Daniel Estulin, the writer of the book, the, book, the true story of the Bilderbergers, every major news outlet, both print and electronic, in the world, in the English language, is either owned by or controlled by a Bilderberger. His latest books list them all if you want to get a copy of it and check exactly who they are. So they did everything possible to support Hillary and to defeat Trump. And the Russians, who had been convinced that the US might be preparing to attack, did what they could to elect somebody that wouldn't, you know, that would be more favorable to them. The whole idea of a war between the US and Russia is totally insane. But there have been people in the Pentagon who ever since World War II have wanted to try that out for size. And there are psychotic generals there today who actually believe that they could start a war with Russia, win it, and walk away to tell the tale. If they believe that, you know where they should be. Because the Russians know too, and they're all prepared, and if it ever did happen, there are Tens of millions of people in the United States who would die. If it got bad enough, it might affect the viability of the whole planet as a home for the human species. So I can understand why the Russians thought a Trump victory might be uh, favorable to them, and especially compared to Clinton, who might just have rubber-stamped a plan from the Pentagon to do a first strike. Well, I must admit that I had a very hearty chuckle when the American politicians and press took umbrage at outside interference in their election. <laughs> I don't go into hysterics easily, but that was about as close as I've come in a long while. The CIA has been doing that in country after country after country for 60 years. And all of a sudden, the chickens come home to the roost. This is a terrible thing, terrible thing. You're interfering in our democracy. <laughs> and whether there was collusion or not between the Trump campaign and the Russia, we don't know. But there was between the Canadian liberals and the U.S. in 1963 because I was part of it. So I know how it works. <laughs> and it worked, just like it worked down there. 
So all we know is that the cabal is out to get Trump. And most of the U.S. intelligence agencies, not all, there are, oh, there are lots of great people, but most of the U.S. intelligence agencies on balance support the cabal in their new world order. And in some areas, it is difficult to gauge how President Trump is doing. But in one of the most important areas, U.S. relations with the Muslim world, he has managed to pour gasoline on the glowing embers. His attempt to ban the whole group of people with Islamic majorities is a tra tra tragedy of the worst order. And because the U.S. is largely responsible in the first place, the plan of the U.S. military industrial complex has been a continuous war. My friend Carol Rosen, who worked with Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist, and was a spokesman for him, and they, Carol said that in his last years, he said they have to have an enemy in order to justify these insanely large uh, military expenditures. And so first it will be the communists, then it will be the terrorists, and then it will be the ETs. And that, of course, is the way that it seems to be working out. But when the Cold War ended, there weren't enough terrorists to, war to warrant a war. And there could have been even fewer if George W. Bush had listened to Osama bin Laden. And I won't read here what Osama said because I'm going to run out of time. But he said, in effect, that he wanted a just settlement of the Palestinian situation, I underline just, and the removal of foreign troops from the peninsula of Muhammad. In other words, what they consider holy ground. And uh, he swore to God that the U.S. would not have peace until those things happened. Well, that is clear enough. The dislike of America had nothing to do with democracy versus dictatorship or wealth or freedom of religion and assembly. It directly related to America's foot dragging and stick handling a just settlement of the Palestinian question while continuing to meddle in Middle Eastern affairs, including the station of troops on what was believed to be sacred soil to Islam. In short, American foreign policy was the root of the conflict. But instead, President Bush didn't listen to Osama, but he did listen to Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, who both came from the Pentagon and were authors, along with others, of the plan for a new American century, which was all part of this plan. And they only had a few countries they wanted to attack, and they all happened to be in the Middle East. And they were looking for something which they said was uh, comparable to Pearl Harbor in order to get the American people behind them in that kind of, uh, of an attack. So. Uh, you got 9-11. It was one of the greatest deceptions in the history of the world. The Bush administration knew weeks in advance that it was going to happen, did absolutely nothing to stop it. In fact, they were involved. And uh, it did accomplish what the people from the Pentagon wanted to accomplish, which that was an excuse to go to war. And they picked Iraq, of course, which had nothing to do with 9-11. And you know, anybody who believes that two little planes could come over and have the thermal energy and the, or the kinetic energy to take down two, not two towers, not even three, but what, five or seven altogether? You can read about that in my book, The Money Mafia. The evidence is all there, and they're all preconditioned for demolition. And not only that, but as Dr. Judy Wood says, and I quote her in the book, uh, a new weapon that you should know about. It's like, what does anybody here remember uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th century? A few of you do. The disintegrators? It was a disintegrator. And the disintegrator that they used, or whatever, pulverized both the steel and the concrete before it hit the ground. You should read about it. 
The result, of course, of going to war with Iraq proved to be disastrous because they kicked out a Sunni minority, at least that was providing peace in the area, and put in a Shia majority who then treated the Sunni minority without mercy, and that resulted ultimately in ISIS, the situation that we're in today. Well, the last thing in the world that we needed was a travel ban in order to exacerbate this unhappy feeling of distrust on both sides. And somehow one of our things that we have to do in the days to come is to try and overcome that kind of distrust and realize that we're all children of God and we have to live together and work together peacefully. An area where I was hoping for some positive action from the new president was our fraudulent banking and financial system. As most of you who have heard me speak know that it's just one giant Ponzi scheme and it's rotten to the core. If you want some proof of that, don't take my word for it. Read Lucifer's Bankers by Bradley C. Birkenfield, Feld, a new book which describes in plain print how the banks have seduced rich people to put their money offshore and not pay taxes on it. You won't find it the kind of reading you like, but it's the kind of reading you should do if you want to know just how rotten the banking system really is. And briefly, a banking system that started out being able to lend the same money twice and get interest from two different people, maybe when the Bank of England was first uh, chartered, reached the stage under Milton Friedman and deregulation where they're lending the same money to 20 different people and collecting interest from 20 different people, organizations or governments all at the same time. Put another way, they're taking 95% off the top. We had an investigation here recently in Montreal about the Sicilian the mafia that were taking 2.5% off the top of uh, city contracts. Here's the banking system taking 95% off the top of every loan they make. And one of the two things that can tame, can tame the cabal is a massive change in banking. We have to change the balance of power. And there's only one way, and that is government-created debt-free money. A massive infusion. And Canada should be leading the way instead of sitting on the sidelines. Because we have done it. We know it works. We own our bank. And we could start it in about two weeks if we had a government that would read our history and then accept the responsibility we have to Canadians and to the world to show what has to be done. The present cartel is like a snake. It gets a country like this, it winds around it, whoops, until it strangles it. And that's what happens to one country after another, including the European Union. And the only way to loosen the, loose, the grip of a snake is to cut its head off. And the only way you can do that is for governments to accept their responsibility not to print all of the money. I have never suggested that. And you can read my books and you can find out what I think. But to do part of it enough so that governments have enough money to do the things that are essential for the needs of the people. And this is becoming more and more necessary all the time as we have artificial intelligence and robots, robots, excuse me, not rabbits, not robots. <laughs> uh, to do the work for us, I was reading something the other day where robots are going to eliminate 50% of the employment in an industry. Huge. Well, what are the other people going to do? There won't be enough tax money to support them. And so there's something for them to do if we get the government in the money creation business so they have some flexibility, and that is to restore our beautiful planet, to undo the damage that we've done to it, to provide more health care old age pensions, to look after people who need help, whether it's the old or the disadvantaged, students who have problems. There are all kinds of positive things to do, but they mean government expenditures and not money that's going to come from private enterprise, and that's the reason we have to get the system changed. 
And I guess one of the reasons that uh, ooh, more hasn't happened in the U.S. is because one of the members of the cabinet is a former partner at Goldman Sachs. And uh, he was a major fundraiser. And that's enough to make anyone cynical about the politics. But the other thing is the reduction of military expenses. I know my time is just about up, so I'm going to race along here. And we're going in the wrong direction. I have a US friend who says, well, they have to replace the money, the armaments that they've uh, used in the Middle East. And I say we should uh, go in the opposite direction. And uh, now an issue that concerned me when I went public in 2005 has come true. I was afraid that we might have the United States Air Force tackling some uh, ships from outside the planet, and that has wasn't possible for years because we didn't have the technology. But now they do, and uh, they're starting to shoot down alien ships, and we don't know whose, and we don't know what the likely consequences are. And I know this, I have a picture I got the other day of, of well, not the other day, a while ago, of an alien ship being lifted out of the ocean by the United States Navy. And so we must sign the treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space. This treaty is the most important document of our time. And two things are paramount. The U.S. must recognize that war is obsolete. It can't be fought, not successfully, and start sharing power with China and Russia. And all countries must change their priorities from spending more on armaments to spending less and changing priorities in favor of peaceful and humanitarian pursuits. Global warming is out of control. And we're building pipelines that can only be amortized in 30 to 50 years. And we're fracking and we're drilling more in the ocean. We must be suicidal. We're out of our minds. Our only war should be a war to save our planet. And this is possible. In my book, I say we had four years, well, two, one of the books, 10 years, now seven years, to win this war. We have the technology. The technology for cold fusion exists. We don't have to invent it. It's there. All we have to do is take it and do the obverse of what we did in World War II. In World War II, we took every automobile plant in the, in the continent and every refrigerator plant and every washing machine plant and we converted them into armaments. And this made it possible to win the war. Today we have to do the exact opposite and take those armaments plants who are keeping the wars going and convert them into plants to make those little boxes coal of zero point energy that you can put in your car or your tractor or your truck or your airplane or your ship or your home and provide all the power you need. And it would employ millions and millions of people. It, was, it is the only way that Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau can keep their promises in far, as far as jobs are concerned. There is no other way. There is, there is nothing on the horizon which would come close to it. So we have to change the banking system, which would provide us with the money to finance the zero-point revolution that is necessary for the future of our planet and of our species. Well, of the species in particular. I think the planet might survive. So one has to be a little bit sympathetic to Trump. The cabal was determined to stop him, and now they're out to get him. So it will be difficult to defang the, the cabal, but it must be done, as my book argues. Congress must resist, rescind or at least suspend the National Security Act so we can get the truth out, because there are thousands of people there, honest people, who want to tell the truth and let us know what's happening. But the penalties at the moment are just so great that they can't take that risk. The cabal, in my opinion, is very corrupt. And as Dr. Stephen Greer's book, Unacknowledged, proves it conclusively, and he will be speaking to us in just a few minutes. In the end, it is a moral and spiritual battle led by the West, led by the US, worships the wrong gods. We have to turn back to the Creator and His wishes for our planet and our people. 
to change the balance of power in favor of the poor, the unemployed, the sick, and the disadvantaged. Is this possible? Yes. Is it probable? That depends entirely on us as individuals. We are writing our own histories, and we will get what we produce. Thank you very much.